We are on, I am on page 123, Other Presentations, the Masters and the Brotherhood. All this while, the adept, besides using his pupil as an apprentice, has been preparing him for presentation to the Great White Brotherhood for initiation. It's a very exciting thought to think that at any day or any hour when we have risen to that level where we are worthy, that we might be presented to the Great White Brotherhood for initiation. The whole object of the existence of that brotherhood is to promote the work of evolution. And the master knows that when the pupil is ready for the stupendous honor of being received as a member of it, he will be of very much more use in the world than before. Therefore, it is his wish to raise his pupil to that level as soon as possible. In the Oriental books on the subject written thousands of years ago are to be found many accounts of this preparatory period of instruction. And when reference has been made to it in the earlier theosophical literature, it has been called the probationary path, the term referring not to being put upon probation by any individual adept, but to a course of general training preparatory to initiation. We should all accept that we are in that preparatory stage. Whether or not we are, we should climb to that level and stay on that level until we have that sense that we have fully self-realized the purposes of that initiation. Leadbeater says, I myself use the term in invisible helpers, but have lately avoided it on account of the confusion caused by the employment of the same word in two distinct senses. The method really adopted is readily comprehensible and is in fact much like that of some of our older universities. If a student wishes to take a degree at one of those, he must first pass the entrance examination of the university and then be admitted to one of the colleges. The head of that college is technically responsible for his progress and may be regarded as his tutor in chief. The man will have to work to a large extent by himself, but the head of his college is expected to see that he is properly prepared before he is presented to take his degree. The head does not give the degree. It is conferred by that abstraction called the university, usually at the hands of its vice chancellor. It is the university, not the head of the college, that arranges the examination and confers the various degrees. The work of the head of the college is to see that the candidate is duly prepared and generally to be to some extent responsible for him. In the process of such preparation, he may, as a private gentleman, enter into whatever social or other relations with his pupil he may think proper, but all that is not the business of the university. Just in the same way, the Great White Brotherhood has nothing to do with the relations between a master and his pupil. That is a matter solely for the private consideration of the master himself. The initiation is given by an appointed member of the Brotherhood in the name of the one initiator. That is the only way in which an initiation can be obtained. Whenever an adept considers that one of his pupils is fit for that first initiation, he gives notice of that fact and presents him for it. The Brotherhood asks only whether the man is ready for initiation and not what is the relationship between him and any adept. It is not their affair whether he is at the stage of probation, acceptance, or sonship. At the same time, it is true that a candidate for initiation must be proposed and seconded by two of the higher members of the Brotherhood, that is to say, by two who have reached the level of adeptship. And it is certain that no master would propose a man for the tests of initiation unless he had, with regard to him, the certainty of his fitness, which could only come from very close identification with his consciousness. The probationary path is thus a stage leading up to the path proper, which begins at the first initiation. In the Oriental books, both these paths are described quite impersonally as though no private masters existed. The questions are first raised. How is a man living in the ordinary world brought to this probationary path, and how does he come to know that such a thing exists? Four ways to the path. In the books, we are told that there are four ways, any one of which may bring a man to the commencement of the path of development. First, 
by being in the presence of and getting to know those who are already interested along that line. Some of us, for example, may have been monks or nuns in the Middle Ages. We may have come into contact in that life with an abbot or abbess who had deep experience of the inner world, a person like St. Teresa. We may, looking up to that leader, have earnestly wished that such experience should come to us, and our wish for that may have been quite unselfish. It may be that we did not think of the importance that would come to us of or of the satisfaction of achievement, but simply of the joy of helping others, as we saw the abbot able to help others through his deeper discernment. Such a feeling in that life would certainly bring us in the next incarnation into touch with teaching on the subject. So the way the set of the sail is in a lifetime and what we accomplish also determines the set of the sail in the future life. It happens that in lands which have the European culture, almost the only way in which we can get the inner teaching put clearly before us is by coming into the Theosophical Society or by reading Theosophical works. There have been mystical or spiritualistic works which have given some information, which have gone a long way, but there are none, so far as I know, which state the case so clearly, so scientifically, as the Theosophical literature has done. I know of no other book which contains such a wealth of information as the secret doctrine. There are, of course, the sacred books of the Hindus and of other nations, and there is a great deal on this subject in those. But it is not put in a way which makes it easy for us with our training to assimilate it or to appreciate it. When, having read theosophical books, we take up some of those beautiful translations of oriental works, we can see our theosophy in them. In the Christian Bible, though that is in many places not well translated from our point of view, we shall find a great deal of theosophy, but before we can find it, we must know the system. When we have studied theosophy, we see at once how many texts support it and cannot rationally be explained without it. We see how church ceremonies, before apparently meaningless, leap into life under the illumination of the teaching and become vivid and full of interest. Yet I never heard of anyone who was, who was able to deduce the theosophical system from either the texts or the ceremony. So one way of approaching the path is by being with those who are already treading it. And so let your companions be those who have the same ardor, the same intensity, the same love for the path as you do so that you are not unequally yoked. Another way is by reading or hearing about it. All this teaching came to me in 1882 through Mr. Sinnott's book, The Occult World, and immediately after that I read his second book, Esoteric Buddhism. I knew at once instinctively that what was written was true, and I accepted it, and to hear and to read about it at once fired me with the desire and the determination the determined intention to know more, to learn all I could on the subject, to pursue it all over the world if necessary, until I found it. Shortly after that, I gave up my position in the Church of England and went out to India because it seemed that more could be done there. There are two ways in which people are led to the path, by reading and hearing of it, and by being in close association with those who are already treading it. The third way, which is mentioned in Oriental books, is by intellectual development. By sheer force of hard thinking, a man may come to grasp some of these principles, though I think that method is rare. Again, they tell us of a fourth way, that by the long practice of virtue, men may come to the beginning of the path, that a man may so develop the soul by steadily practicing the right so far as he knows it, that eventually more and more of the light will open before him. So do you want to summarize the four ways? Just tell me what the four ways are. Being with people who have the teaching is number one, isn't it? And the second one is? Reading. Reading the theosophic, theosophical literature and others. And three? which I think he thinks is the least uh, accelerating, and then the fourth. Building up the soul by practicing virtue. I think that you are on this path, and you should stay on it and be very steady, 
and have a very strong mind and don't allow your mind to compromise the great virtues that you would embody. The Buddhist classification. 40 years ago, when the qualifications for the path were first put before me from the esoteric Buddhist point of view, they were given as follows. The first of them, discrimination, called by the Hindus, viveka, was described as, I, can't, I, I don't like to say this word when I can't pronounce it. Karanjit, would you pronounce it, please? Dis- Manod Vara Vajana. <laughs> Manod v- va- Vara va- Vajana. Which means the opening of the doors of the mind. Opening of the doors of the mind. Or perhaps escaping by the door of the mind. That is a very interesting way of putting it, since discrimination arises from the fact that our minds have been opened in such a way that we can understand what is real and what is unreal, what is desirable and what undesirable, and can distinguish between the pairs of opposites. The second qualification, desirelessness, known as vairagya, among the Hindus, was taught to me as parakama, meaning preparation for action, the idea being that we must prepare ourselves for action in the occult world by learning to do right purely for right's sake. I think that should be um, a little sign in every office. It's very important. Learning to do right purely for right's sake. That, that is the highest path and gets you to union with God the most swiftly. This involves the attainment of a condition of higher indifference, higher indifference in which one certainly no longer cares for the results of action. That is our ninth point in Quietly Comes the Buddha, not having uh, a concern. Someone remember the wording of that? Oh, it's a non-attachment to the fruit of action. Indifference, in which one certainly no longer cares for the results of action. Non-attachment to the fruit of action. And so it comes to mean the same thing as desirelessness, though it is put from a different point of view. The six points of good conduct called Shatsampati in the Hindu scheme were given as Upachara, which means attention to conduct. For the convenience of the student, we would like to compare the six points with those given in At the Feet of the Master. I will reprint here what I said about them in Invisible Helpers. Sama, quietude, that purity and calmness of thought which comes from perfect control of the mind a qualification exceedingly difficult of attainment and yet most necessary. For unless the mind moves only in obedience to the guidance of the will, it cannot be a perfect instrument for the master's work in the future. This qualification is a very comprehensive one and includes within itself both the self-control and the calmness necessary for astral work. Dhamma, subjugation, a similar mastery over, and therefore purity in, one's actions and words, a quality which again follows necessarily from its predecessor. Uparati, cessation, explained as a cessation from bigotry or from belief in the necessity of any act or ceremony prescribed by a particular religion so leading the aspirant to independence of thought and to a wide and generous tolerance. I'm going to pronounce that one. Titika. Titika. Endurance or forbearance, by which is meant the readiness to bear with cheerfulness whatever one's karma may bring upon one and to part with anything and everything worldly whenever it may be necessary. It also includes the idea of complete absence of resentment for wrong, the man knowing that those who do him wrong are but instruments of his own karma. 
the man knowing that those who do him wrong are but instruments of his own karma. Samadana, intentness, one-pointedness involving the incapability of being turned aside from one's path by temptation. These are marvelous precepts, aren't they? Sada, faith, confidence in one's master and oneself. Confidence, that is, that the master is a competent teacher and that however diffident the pupil may feel as to his own powers, he has yet within him that divine spark which, when fanned into a flame, will one day enable him to achieve even as his master has done. The fourth qualification in the Hindu classification is called, you can say that way. Again? Mamukshutva. Usually translated as an ardent longing for liberation from the wheel of births and deaths. While among the Buddhists, the name given to it is Anuloma. Is that right? which means direct order or succession, signifying that its attainment follows as a natural consequence from the other three. This ardent longing for liberation and this ardent longing being the greatest longing, you will arrive at this very goal, free from the wheel of births and deaths. Hindu yoga. The series of qualifications described above is at once seen to be quite in accord with those given in At the Feet of the Master, which in turn have exactly the same framework as those mentioned in the books ascribed in India to Shankaracharya and his followers for the use of candidates aiming at yoga. The term yoga, which has long been used in India, means union. And as that is generally considered to imply union with the divine, it is in fact unity. But the expression refers in all the different schools of yoga in India, not only to the distant goal of union, but also to the methods of training prescribed as leading to that goal. Therefore, some say that the meaning of yoga is meditation, which plays a part in most of the systems. It must not be assumed, however, that meditation is the only or even the principal means to yoga, for there have been and still are many different schools, each having its own special methods. Professor Ernest Wood has described the seven principal schools of yoga in Raja Yoga, the occult training of the Hindus, and has shown how they belong each to one of the seven rays, so that they must be regarded as complementary and not as rival methods of practice. Each great teacher expounded a method suited to one type of ego, a fact so well known among the Hindus that they are always liberal and tolerant in their thought and consider it perfectly right for each man to follow the method which suits his temperament. This book explains that in each school there are certain characteristics similar to those which prevail in the teaching of our masters. There is always a preliminary training. That's number one. There is always a preliminary training accompanied by the requirement of high moral attainments before the candidate can enter the path proper and on reaching that path he is always advised to see a master or guru. In the school of Patanjali, for example, which is the first to be treated as it is the oldest of which we have any written record, there are ten commandments, the first five of which are negative prohibiting injury to others, untruth, theft, incontinence, and greed, and the second five positive, enjoining cleanliness, contentment, effort, study, and devotion. In the preliminary course of training, there are three requirements, tapas, or effort, svadhyaya, svadhyaya, Svadhiya, or study of one's own nature with the aid of the scriptures, and Ishvara, Pranidhana, or devotion to God at all times. These the author compares respectively with our three qualifications of Shatsampati, or good conduct, which involves the use of the will in a number of efforts, Viveka, or discrimination, which implies understanding of the true and the false, 
inside and outside oneself, and vairagya or desirelessness, since personal emotions can best be transcended by devotion. Since personal emotions can best be transcended by devotion. After developing these preliminary requirements, the candidate on the path uses his will to master and employ every part of his nature in a series of steps, physical, etheric, astral, mental, and beyond. And because of this, the school is described as of the first ray on which the use of the will predominates. The second school of yoga is that of Sri Krishna, particularly expounded in the great poem, the Bhagavad Gita, which has been translated with such accuracy and beauty by Dr. Basant, and also in a freer rendering by Sir Edwin Arnold under the title of The Song Celestial. This teaches above all else the doctrine of love. The disciple Arjuna to whom the Guru spoke was a great lover of mankind. According to the scripture, this great soldier sank down upon the floor of his chariot before the battle of Kurukshetra, Kurukshetra, Kurukshetra began, full of sorrow because he loved his enemies and could not bear to injure them. The teacher Sri Krishna then explained to him, amid much philosophical teaching, that the greatest thing in life is service, that God himself is the greatest server for he keeps the wheel of life revolving, not because any benefit can possibly accrue to him in consequence, but for the sake of the world, and that men should follow his example and work for the welfare of mankind. Many great ones, he said, had reached perfection by following this path of life, by doing their duty without personal desire. To love without ceasing is the way of the second ray, in the Gita, it is shown how this love should be directed to men and other beings in karma yoga, the yoga by action or work, and to God in bhakti yoga, the yoga by devotion. Once more, three preliminary teachings are given. To reach the love wisdom, a candidate must practice devotion or reverence, inquiry or investigation, and service the first involving right emotion, the second right thought and understanding, and the third right use of the will in practical life, which again are compared to our first three qualifications. It is particularly interesting to note that the teacher says that when the candidate has prepared himself in this triple way, the wise ones who know the essence of things will teach you the wisdom. In other words, the aspirant will find the master. Three, the third school, that of Shankaracharya, as already mentioned, presents the qualifications in the order in which we have them, placing vivika or discrimination first. It is intended for those people whose temperaments leads them to want to understand what they are about not only what service they ought to perform, but in what way their contribution fits into the scheme of things and the development of mankind. It must be noted that the Master Kuthumi is presenting these qualifications. In presenting these qualifications has interpreted them all newly in the light of love. The fourth school is that of Hatha Yoga. Rightly understood, this involves a severe physical purification and training intended to bring the body into a perfect state of health, orderly functioning and refinement, so as to enable the ego using it to attain as much as is possible for him in the present incarnation. To this end, there are many practices, including breathing exercises, intended to act upon the nervous system and the etheric double, as well as upon those parts of the dense body, usually trained in courses of physical culture. Unfortunately, very much of what appears in the popular literature on this subject reflects only a superstitious distortion of the real teaching and describes various repellent forms of subjugation and mortification of the body, which were common also in Europe a few centuries ago. But in all the Sanskrit books dealing with Hatha Yoga, it is clearly stated that the object of the physical practices is to bring the body into the highest state of health 
and efficiency. The fifth school, denominated Laya Yoga, aims at awakening the higher faculties of man through a knowledge of Kundalini, the serpent power, which in most people lies latent at the base of the spine and of the seven chakras or force centers through which the awakened power is guided. Of these centers and this force I have already written to some extent in the inner life and the hidden side of things. I have now gathered this material together made some additions to it and published a monograph on the subject with large colored illustrations of the seven chakras and of the courses of the various pranas or streams of vitality. The methods of this and the previous school are not, however, recommended to Western students or indeed to anyone who is not specially directed by a competent teacher to practice them. They are suitable only for those who have the oriental physical heredity and can live as simply and peacefully as do some orientals. For others, they are not only unlikely to be successful, but are distinctly dangerous to health and even to life. I have known many sad cases of disease and madness to result from attempts on these lines, especially in America. So all of our teaching from the Ascended Masters has been again and again not to attempt to awaken the serpent power, not to force the raising of the Kundalini. The way the sacred fire rises on our altar of being is because we, the way in which we do this, is we press down the violet flame. We direct the light into all of our chakras. As this pressure is pressed down because we are delivering the sacred fire in our bodies daily, then we have the avenue of the kundalini that will rise gently. Just because of the fact that we are doing our decrees, doing our violet flame, or even doing the Eastern mantras that we have in our songbooks. So I have never felt the necessity of going into this practice, and Mark and Moria have never recommended it. But I know that various teachers from the East who have held their students around them have taught them to have male and female face each other, looking to each other's eyes, and then using that contact to raise the kundalini. And that is where people have become mad and where they have prematurely raised the kundalini and can literally go insane. And I can remember in earlier years when these various yogis were coming around that people would come to me very greatly injured because they had followed these Eastern gurus who are false gurus for the most part. Sixth. The sixth school is that of bhakti or devotion. This is also taught to a large extent in the Bhagavad Gita. Indeed, we find it in every religion among those true devotees who put their trust entirely in the divine, who do not pray for personal favors, but are quite convinced that God is perfect master of his world, that he knows what he is doing, and that therefore all is well. They are therefore more than content they are thrilled with ecstasy if they can but have the opportunity and the privilege to serve and obey him in any way. Next comes uh, a lengthy dissertation on mantras, which I find very interesting. Seventh, lastly, we have the seventh school, which in India is called Mantra Yoga. It may be well to expound its principle here at somewhat greater length than the others, for the ray of which it is one of the principal expressions is just now becoming dominant in the world and is playing a large and increasing part among us in both East and West. The word mantra is Sanskrit and is practically equivalent to our word charm or spell. The majority of mantras used in India for good purpose are verses from the Vedas, pronounced with intention according to the traditional methods, which are the outcome of practical occult knowledge. There are also many mantras employed by men who follow the tantras, and these are just as often used for evil as for good. We, we do not espouse tantric yoga either. So we find afloat in India a great number of them both desirable and undesirable. If we are to classify them from our Western point of view, I should say that there are five main types of these mantras. Those that work simply by faith, those that work by association, those that work by agreement or covenant, those that work by their meaning, those that work by their sound without reference to meaning. 
Then comes the story of the effect of faith. The first class produce their effect simply because of the strong conviction of the operator that the result must follow and because of the faith of the person upon whom they are operating. If both men are quite sure that something will happen, say the cure of a wound or a disease, then that thing does happen. And in some cases, the faith of only one of the parties seems to be sufficient. In England, and indeed among the peasants in all countries, quite a number of such charms are being used in country places. People have little forms of words, generally semi-religious in character, which have been handed down to them by their forefathers, and these are supposed to produce definite results. They often seem the merest nonsense. The wording is frequently not even coherent. They are probably corruptions of certain forms of words, either in English or in some case Latin or French. They do not work by sound, for they have none of the sonority indispensable to the true mantra. But when recited over patients under certain conditions, they are at times unquestionably effective. In such cases, it must be faith in the ancient formula which produces the result. Many similar charms found in Oriental countries appear to act through faith. I can give one example from my personal knowledge, which I suspect to be of that nature. Once when I was in the interior of Ceylon, I was bitten rather badly in the hand by a dog. The wound was bleeding considerably. A casual passerby, an agricultural laborer by the look of him, rushed up, snatched a leaf off the nearest shrub, pressed it on the wound, and muttered some words which I could not understand, and the wound immediately stopped bleeding. This charm, therefore, undoubtedly worked, and certainly not through any faith of mine, for I had no idea of what the man was going to do. As is also the case in the East, the man would not take any money for the exercise of his powers. So far as I was able to hear the words, I should say that they were incoherent, or if coherent, were at any rate neither Sinhalese, which would have been the man's own language, nor Sanskrit. I have been told that there are similar charms against snake bite in Ceylon, and they also appear to work again by faith, I imagine. Everyone concerned is sure that something is going to happen, and so it does happen. There is a variant of this type in which success is achieved by the strength of will of the operator. As he speaks his words or makes his sign, he is utterly determined that a given result shall follow, and accordingly it does follow. I have seen Prince Harasinghji Rapsinghji of Kathiawar. Would you like to say that? Prince Harasinghji and Rapsinghji of Kathiawar. Cure instantly a man suffering from the sting of a scorpion. The man was already pallid and half fainting from fright, writhing and groaning in acute pain, and scarcely able to drag himself along with the assistance of two friends. The prince made over the wound the sign of the five-pointed star, spoke sharply one Sanskrit word, and in a moment the victim, who had sunk to the ground, staggered to his feet, declaring himself well and entirely free from pain, and then proceeded to prostrate himself before the prince in gratitude. I would like to ask any of you if you'd like to take the lectern, if you have not taken it before, and talk to us about your thoughts since last week. My question has to do with uh, chatter. A lot has been said about chatter, and uh, I probably have the opposite problem, not chattering enough. And I was wondering if you had anything to say, you know, on. Uh, like why somebody would uh, be more quiet than not. I, there must be some, uh, I don't think I'm a saint because I walk around not saying anything. There must be some you know, psychological thing that's in there that you might want to point out to me. Well, we, we have this section in the book, you know, on irritability and laughter and idle words and worry and selfishness. Uh, if I could have mentioned this to you earlier, I would have had everyone read this section because I think it's, very important. It starts out with become as little children. And then it gets into all these these things that we get into. The irritability, which um, I see as um, a serious liver problem, um, is irritability. And possibly others who have delved into this um, would know more about that uh, physiological condition. Selfishness, of course, um, It's almost like 
you, you eat up yourself when you're selfish and you have less and less of selfhood being selfish. Worry is, is to me a condition of the nerves. You know, I, I'm not a, an expert on this, that's just my sense of it. Uh, there's laughter, and then they talk about the right and the wrong kind of laughter. And of course, all this is misusing one or more of the chakras. The idle words are taken up, which Jesus said in, the, in his scripture, for every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account on the day of judgment. Every word and every thought has its karma. If the pupil could live the perfect life, he would himself already be an adept. Forms made by speech, where um, either speech is not well pronounced or people don't have the vocabulary to express what they are intending to express, um, and therefore they, they cannot uh, fully give to anyone uh, an understanding of the path. And then, the, then there follows a dissertation on speaking correctly, clearly, beautifully. Those who cannot be accurate in their use of words cannot be precise in their thinking. Even in morality, they will be vague, for all these things react one upon the other. Then there is the section on fuss, especially is it necessary for the aspirant to avoid all fidgetiness or fussiness. Many an energetic and earnest worker spoils most of his efforts and makes them of no effect by yielding to these failings. Be absolutely accurate, but attain your accuracy by perfect calmness. Never hurry or fuss. Another point that it is necessary to impress upon our students is that in occultism, we always mean exactly what we say, neither more nor less. When a rule is laid down that nothing unkind or critical must be said about another, just that is exactly what is meant. Then there's the value of association. There can be positive and negative values in associations. So coming back to chatter, I think it's a yin condition. I think um, we know that when we drink coffee that it um, makes us talk more. You become more talkative when you drink coffee. That's why they have coffee houses and bring you sweets and you can drink coffee for half a day and never stop talking and thinking that you're giving marvelous dissertations about all kinds of profound things. Um, so I, I think chatter is um, like a leak like a, a leaky vessel, like we have some hole somewhere in ourselves and all of that sacred fire that we, we draw from doing our dynamic decrees somehow goes down that hole because people are constantly chattering. I think the more you grow on the path, the less you want to talk and the more you want to go within and commune with your God. So why don't we talk about things that are necessary, things that have to do with our accomplishing our service, in our departments, things that um, are part of our work. And uh, when we're having good times, we should introduce uh, more lofty subjects or interesting things about the world or theater or opera or whatever the people who come together are most interested in so that um, whatever we do, we can reach a certain level of elevation of consciousness and with it raise the sacred fire and not squander it. So everything I just named were leaky vessels. We're leaking on the point of irritability. We're leaky on the point of this. We're leaking on the point of that. So obviously a leaky vessel isn't going to make it. So it takes discipline because we have momentums of all these things. Is there any uh, advice you can give for keeping the mind still? Like it, it, it Don't let like it get yin. I thought you were going to say that. Yep. <laughs> There's only two conditions, right? Yin, yang. So it, you have to stay there because I'm not f finished talking to you. <laughs> um, it's very important to have command over the mind. It is, it is the greatest asset that you have. And if you can't stick with the mind and meditate through that mind and get to the mind of God, what are you holding on to? What is, what is the rock that enables you to be who you are and for you to tr transcend yourself? It is the mind. And let that mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So our minds don't work well when we're very fatigued or we, we have more yin food than we, we should be taking in. So if you compromise what you can do because you prefer... Um, a certain amount of yin substances, 
it will take you far longer to to make your ascension. We we just have to cut it out if we're going to get there. I mean, so there's a low road and the high road. <laughs> we'll stay on the low low road a long time. You know, I I uh, was uh, speaking to someone who called in, who was. Uh, very overweight at an early age, and uh, they were telling me that um, they couldn't make themselves stop eating, they couldn't make themselves do this, they, they couldn't keep promises to themselves. It's like, um, do everything for me, you know, tie my shoes and tell me what to do. And I finally said to this person, if you don't hurry up and change, you may very well pass on in your 20s. And that's the tough talk I gave to him, because uh, there's an only one way to talk to somebody who says, I can't do this, I can't do that. So that's a serious situation when we're not even control, in control of what we put in our mouth. And most of the time, if we're not in control as to what we put in our mouth, we have no control over what comes out of our mouth either. And that's the chatter. So that's about it. You can you can see the rest, I'm sure, without me having to say it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. I'm one of those that came here via the Theosophical Society, and so I'm finding this very exciting for me. And um, uh, I had been searching for about 10 years when I found the Theosophical Society, and it was like an oasis in the desert. These teachings are like finding the ocean at the end of the desert. But at that time, I thought it was really just what I needed. And um, I read about 20, 30 books in the first few years. Everything I could find, I read. And I think I got uh, top heavy because I, I started feeling like I wasn't doing anything. You know, I was, I was just reading and thinking and thinking and reading and participating. You know in all the groups that they had going. And um, so I found that I was making progress, but I was sliding back. You know, it was like I'd go forward and fall back and go forward and fall back. And now I realize it was because we didn't have the violet flame. I couldn't clear myself. And I would, I would, I would think I was doing pretty good. And <clears> then <throat> all of a sudden something would happen and I was, felt like I was back where I started, and it was very discouraging. And when I first went there, I looked at everybody and <clears throat> with my critical eye, and I thought, well, how come you know all these teachings and you're just like everybody else? You know, where's my example? You know, I need an example. And after reading all these books and being there about five years, I looked at myself and I said, you know, you're not an example. You're reading all these books and you can't do what you know. And um, in this book, it talks about the uh, schisms sometimes that happens in the so Theosophical Society. And when I was in this one, it was in um, Adelaide, South Australia. <clears throat> and they want one group wanted to go off and do one thing, and the other one said, no, no, we don't do things like that. We stay and do this. And so uh, they were having all these problems, and people were talking about one another, they were criticizing one another, and they were gossiping about one another. And I was totally disillusioned at that point. I was disillusioned with them, and then something happened in my life, and I was disillusioned with myself, and I just sort of left. So I, and I didn't follow any, any teachings, anything for a while. I just sort of went away from it all, and I felt like I just had to work on myself. And um, <clears throat> it was not easy, but I felt all the time I had to serve and serve and serve. And, and because I didn't have guidance, I made a lot of mistakes, for which I'm quite sorry now, but um, I learned from them. <laughs> and then um, in 1983, I was taking an astrology class, and the, um, so I was doing my own astrology chart, and I got really confused over in a configuration and so I took it to my teacher, and she said, oh, my goodness, let me put it on the board. Let me work on it. Let me, uh, you know, help you with it. So she put it on the board, and I don't remember anything else she said, but one thing she said was that uh, in about 
two weeks, you're going to meet somebody through communication who's going to make you do service. And I, and I was really taken aback because I didn't, I'm happy to do service, but I was not feeling very happy about being made to do service. <laughs> so I didn't know what to do, so I went home and I cleaned house. And <laughs> I cleaned house and I cleaned it for two weeks. And then I sort of forgot about it. And I was handed a book uh, uh, then um, by my son and um, Robert, which some of you know. And I took it home and I was reading it. And I knew who it was by because I'd had him in theosophy. I knew, you know, he was the one I really leaned to in theosophy. And I'm sitting on my bed, and I'm reading this book, and tears are coming down my eyes, and I'm feeling, you know, oh, you know, oh, <laughs> you know, I just can't describe my feelings. And um, then I looked at my clock, and I booked my calendar, and I realized that this was a day that I was going to meet this person. And who it was was Al Moya, and I was reading Chila on the Path, and in it, he talks about doing service. And I say, oh my goodness, I said, um, there's nobody in the world that can make me do service but you, Elmoya. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, within about six months later, I'm at the conference here, and then I came on staff. But w one of the cute things that I thought that happened was in uh, June, I'd come all the way from Australia. I'd spent all my money to get here. and. Um, I've been looking for these teachings for 25 years or 20 years at that point. And <clears throat> the first uh, dictation was up in the heart, and I've been looking so forward to it, and I just couldn't wait to get there, and I've been decreeing all day. And um, just before the dictation, somebody, somebody got up and said, anybody who has a cough has to go to an overflow. And I said, I have a cough, but I, I can't go, you know, I can't leave. I mean, after all these years and all this I've been through, I can't go. And um, all these people are leaving the room, you know, I'm thinking, no, I can't go. And this voice says, you need to go now. And I said, oh, no, no, I can't go now. <laughs> I can't go. I'll be good. You, you must go now. No, 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 I won't cough. I promise I won't cough. Get up and get out. <laughs> it was in my head, you know, and I, I grabbed my bag, whoops, and I ran as fast as I could out the, out the door. <laughs> you know, everything's saying. <laughs> and I get over into the overflow, and I'm watching my dictation, which is Elmoya. And uh, I don't know what else he said in the dictation, but he said, when I give an instruction, I am talking to you. I'm not talking to somebody else. <laughs> so that was a good start to coming on staff. <laughs> but I'm really grateful to be here. And Did I'm you cough in the overflow? <laughs> I can't remember, but probably because I coughed a lot. <laughs> I'm really grateful to be here, and I'm grateful to have been on staff these 12 years, and all the blessings and these teachings. These are, are you know, what I prayed for so many years, and um, even these, this book that we're studying. Um, I don't remember absorbing it the way I'm absorbing it now. So it's either you've, <laughs> we're, we've lifted, been lifted up to a, an area where I can feel it more. The violet flame. Pardon? The, the violet, violet flame is violet the key. Flame, I'm sure. It gives you the comprehension, clears the brain, the mind. Right. That's why we do understand things. So the violet flame, I am so grateful for. I'm grateful for these teachings. And I know without a doubt that you just cannot leave the path. You just cannot, we cannot leave the path, you know. I made so many mistakes when I turned away from the teachings before that I know you just, we just cannot do it. So, thank you very much. Thank God bless. You. Hi, Mother. Staff. Uh, this is a story also about when I first came into the teaching. And uh, it was back at Camelot. And you might remember we had uh, those two week seminars back in the early days of Camelot. And what we, it was uh, the early beginnings of a. Uh, my darshan with you. And uh, we used to have, a, it was in a small, we met every day with mother and it was in a small room 
It was actually before we built, built the uh, SU classroom. There was a small room in between. And there was only about um, 20 students taking the summer, the, the two-week programs. And you would come every day. And this is a little story that is a, a witness to you as the guru. And it's a witness to Darshan. And uh, we were decreeing and uh, waiting for you to come. And we were doing Violet Flame. And, uh, and I was sitting by the window. And, and you could look out at Camelot. And you could see uh, Jesus' statue. And it was just a very beautiful, lush green of California. And I was looking out. And uh, it was the violet flame was going. And it was you know, just very intense with the light of the violet flame. And I looked out, and I was kind of gazing out the window. And these temples of light just came down in, in the, uh, where, the, where the green grass was. And uh, they almost looked like, uh, you know, they were uh, almost looked like the Taj Mahal type architecture. And I looked, and it was just very subtle and not flashy, but uh, just very beautiful and very uh, serene. And I looked, and I saw that. And then at the same time I was looking at that, you walked in the room. And it was like that those temples descended on the property and you came in at the same time. And it was, uh, although it was very subtle, it was very powerful. And it, uh, I've always just kept it in my heart all these years. And uh, I've been on staff a long time. And uh, it's just helped me. One of the reasons I wanted to express it is it helped me not to take this experience for granted. That when, when you come, and it's not only you, but it's, it's the darshan. It's that experience of you, the guru, and us, the chilas, being together that I felt was the specialness of that, where the, the temple came down, you were there, and it was as special to you as it was to us. And it wouldn't, if we weren't there, it wouldn't, the, the temples wouldn't have descended. And I just always remembered that. And, you know, when you're, when you're here and, you know, like even now, you know, people are saying, well, Darshan's every Wednesday, you know, I can't come every Wednesday. Or, you know, they might find something else to do. And all these years, I've never allowed that thought or that uh, to not want to come to services, to not want to be a part, because I, I always felt uh, that specialness of, of the student and the master being together. I just want to thank you. I think there's a, a great mystique when the Guru and Chilas come together and all at our, are at a certain level. As many of you here have been here with me 20, 10, 20, 30 years. Um, it, it, it is definitely a mystical experience each time we come together. You know, I've been coming on Wednesdays, and um, it's different now. It's bigger. There's more people. And uh, the camera's here. <laughs> and, uh, big and changes, I, huh? <laughs> well, not so big, but changes. And I also I looked at that experience of darshan in the future, and and that experience that I had that day of the, the temples of light, just noticing it descending, and I could see this experience. Maybe there'd be more people, but the camera being there and and this being experienced in Minneapolis and in Hong Kong and and everywhere where the people would do the decrees, set the force field. Because I, I felt that that was special, that we rose up. We took the time to, to raise ourselves up to receive you. And, and I've just been, these past Wednesdays, I've been having that exp vision of the future where this would be live TV, and everybody that was at the centers would be able to see it. And those same temples would descend where they were also. And it was just uh, heartwarming. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we are in the middle of this chapter. Association of thought. There are mantras which work by association. Certain forms of words bring with them definite ideas and quite change the current of our thoughts and feelings. 
An example of this is the national anthem of a country. As soon as we hear that strain, we straighten ourselves up instinctively and pour out our loyalty and goodwill towards the land and its ruler. And this evokes a definite response, for according to the law, force so outpoured unselfishly must call down a corresponding descent of power from on high. This response comes through, us, through certain types of angels connected with the work of the first ray. And the attention of these is attracted whenever the national anthem is sung, and they pour out their blessing upon and through the people whose loyalty has been thereby stimulated. So we see that angels on the first ray stimulate uh, the blessing through the national anthem. So I think when we all read this, this page uh, personally and individually, we realize that the fervor that we do give into our patri patriotic music is multiplied many times over by the legions of the first ray. So we should remember that and give them a lot of joy and a lot of energy because they really do love uh, to get out and, and uh, sing the songs of patriotism with us. Another example, though far less powerful, of a similar type of mantra is the voice that breathed or Eden. We cannot hear that hymn without thinking strongly of a wedding and all the festive feeling of goodwill usually connected with such a function. Various Christmas hymns and carols also invoke in our minds a very definite stream of thought. The war cries which played so prominent a part in the battles of medieval times were mantras of this type. There are a number of such forms which instantly call up corresponding ideas and they produce results because of their associations and not because of anything inherent in themselves. Angelic cooperation. There are certain mantras which work by agreement or by covenant. Most religions appear to have some examples of this type. The great Mohammedan call from the minaret partakes of this character, although it has also something about it of the type which we have last considered. It is a declaration of faith. There is no God but God, or as some have translated it, there is nothing but God which is an eternal truth and Muhammad is the prophet of God. It is interesting to see the effect produced upon the people by these words. It is far more than the mere thought of their meaning, for it calls up in those who hear it a fiery faith, an outburst of devotion, which is quite beautiful in its way and very characteristic of Muhammadanism. This might be a mere instance of association, but for the fact that angels of a certain type are evoked by the call and it is their action which causes much of the enthusiasm which is exhibited. I was, I was interested in this entire chapter because of how much it, it does associate angels side by side with us. It is perhaps in the Christian religion that we find the best examples of this third type of mantra. As those who know anything of the services of the church will realize, the greatest of them all is hoc corpus est meum, this is my body. For the Christ himself has made a covenant with his church that whenever that call is uttered, this is my body, whenever those words are pronounced in any language by one of his duly ordained priests, he will respond thereto. But this power is given under conditions, given only to those who are prepared by another mantra of the same type to receive it, a mantra also prescribed by Christ himself, the words, Receive ye the Holy Ghost the power which with these words he gave to his disciples just before he left them has been handed down with the same words in an unbroken chain for nigh 2,000 years and constitutes what is called the apostolic succession. Whenever a priest who has been duly ordained in that succession pronounces with intention those other words, this is my body, a certain wonderful change is thereby brought about in the bread over which he speaks them so that though its outward appearance remains the same, its higher principles or counterparts are superseded by the very life of the Christ himself, so that it becomes just as truly his vehicle as was the body which he wore in Palestine. When you have that profound conviction and profound faith that that is so, that the very body of Christ that, we wore, that he wore in Palestine is the substance, the body, which you take in of, of his essence. So that is a, a tremendous realization, and the human mind doubts it almost instantly when it hears it. 
that this could be the very life of Christ himself in that which we partake of 2,000 years later. There is no doubt of the working of this mantra, this is my body, for its action can be seen today by those who have eyes to see. Lord Tennyson tells us in the Idols of the King that Galahad, describing the celebration of the Eucharist, said, I saw the fiery face as of a child that smote itself into the bread. That smote itself into the bread. And just so any clairvoyant who watches the offering of that same holy sacrifice today may see the counterpart of the bread flash out into a line of living light when the same sacred mantra is spoken. All the branches of the Christian Church, the Roman Catholic, the Greek Orthodox, the Anglican, the liberal Catholic churches that celebrate the Holy Eucharist at all in the form which was laid down by the Christ use those words as part of their liturgy, and in all of them that wonderful result is produced. All these branches of the Church, too, invoke the angelic hosts to assist in their service, and that is done not only by a particular form of words, but also when the service is sung by a particular form of music, by an arrangement of sounds which has persisted with but slight variation from an early period in the history of the Church. The angels of a special type take those words as a call and at once attend to play their part in the service which is to be held. So it's a glorious thing to really see the spiritualization of our four lower bodies, our mind, our hearts, our beings, so that we can accept these things without doubt. Doubt is a tremendous enemy. We give him no power. We should not call him tremendous. But doubt is really what shatters our greatest joys, hopes, realities, dreams, convictions, uh, determinations that we will transcend and have our victory and so forth. So this action of the angels, we must get beyond our doubt because our angels can make light work for us, can help us, can heal us. It's, it's very important that you tackle the two o'clock line. This is what Moria is telling me for you. So please take it to heart. It's the line of Jesus and Pisces. And this is the time for Jesus' true teachings to go forth. The effect of repetition, we come now to a class of mantras which act by virtue of the meaning of the words repeated. A man recites a certain form of words with firm confidence over and over again so that their meaning beats very strongly upon his brain and upon his mental body. And if he is trying, for instance, to do a certain piece of occult work, such a repetition will greatly strengthen his will. Such mantras can be used in many different ways. As far as the man is concerned, they produce one of two effects. Either they strengthen his will to do that which he is trying to do, or they impress upon him the absolute conviction that it will be done. Mantras of this type appear in the daily meditations prescribed for the Hindus and in most occult schools. The repetition of certain sentences at fixed points during the day tends to impress the ideas contained in the sentences strongly upon the mind. I always think that the time to recite a mantra is when you're walking from the court to the cafeteria and the amount of mantras you can give in that span with, with deep meditation and, and profound peace is quite a lot. So make use of those, those little comings and goings and choose the mantra, choose the ones that we have from the Eastern Masters, but make at least one mantra your own so that you have given it so long that it is in your mind and you awaken in the night and you're still giving the mantra. More radiant than the sun, purer than the snow, subtler than the ether is the self, the spirit within my heart. I am that self, that self am I, is a good example of this type of mantra, and it is, of course, just as effective when thought as when spoken aloud. This is one of the few things I've disagreed with in this entire book. Uh, I, I do not believe that any mantra is just as effective when thought as when spoken aloud. Um, the spoken word is the word of, of choice of Elohim, who pronounced, let there be light, and there was light as the most colossal fiat of the entire cosmos. 
So this is not a big deal if you know it and realize that this is not correct. But if you are going to follow it and think that it is true, you can be off the path for many years thinking that all you have to do is think a mantra and not use your throat chakra. Blessings. Under this heading should come the various types of blessings such as are given in the church, in the temple, in the mosque, in Freemasonry, and by the pupils of our masters. Blessings may be arranged in two sections, those which a man gives from himself and those which are given through him as an official by higher power. The first kind of blessing is merely an expression of an earnest good wish. A typical instance of this is the blessing sometimes given by a father to his son, either on the deathbed of the former or when the latter is about to start on some long and possibly dangerous journey. The blessing of the dying Isaac to his sons Esau and Jacob is a good illustration, though in that particular case complications were introduced by the scandalous duplicity of Jacob. Readers of the scripture account of this incident will remember that Isaac was fully persuaded of the effectiveness of his blessing, and when he discovered the deceit which had been practiced upon him, he was unable to reverse the wish which he had expressed. The question then arises, does a blessing of this nature bring any result, and if so, how is that result produced? The only reply that can be given is that this will depend upon the earnestness of the good wish and the amount of spiritual force put into it. I like the use of the word spiritual force because it is akin to fohat, and force to me uh, is something that's, that's physical as well as having sound. And it's been used a number of times this evening so that you can understand that when you give a decree and you put spiritual force into it, you get spiritual force out of it multiplied many, many times over. If you don't think the spiritual force has any meaning and you just go bobbing along saying the words and thinking about other things, you're not pouring your spiritual force into the mantra, hence you will not have the benefits of the mantra. The blessing makes a thought form which attaches itself to the person who is blessed. The size, strength, and persistence of that thought form depend upon the willpower of the person giving the benediction the willpower. If the words were uttered as a matter of form without much feeling or intention behind them, the effect would be slight and transient. On the other hand, if they came from a full heart and were uttered with definite determination, their effect would be deep and lasting. So if you put your whole heart into a decree, the elements of that decree, the thought form of it, will be deep and lasting. That mantra will move with you. It will be in your aura. It will be a point of power. It will be a point of contact with God. So how much more important it is that we give our mantras with all the power and all the love and all the desire and the determination that we have to change ourselves and to change the world. So I urge you to strengthen your bodies. Be a little bit more young than yin and really release the fire, the sacred fire for your victory and use the mantras as chalices. The second type of blessing is that which is uttered by an official appointed for the purpose through whom power flows from some higher source. A good example of this is the benediction with which most church services conclude. This may not be given by anyone whose ecclesiastical rank is lower than that of priest. And to this extent, the blessing may be said to partake of the character of the mantras, of mantras of the third class, since the power of giving a definite blessing is one of those conferred upon the priest at his ordination. In this case, he is simply a channel for the power from on high, and if it should unfortunately happen that he speaks it merely as a matter of course and as part of his ritual, that would make no difference to the spiritual power outpoured and that is because he has been given an office. And so he, he holds an office, and therefore, basically, through him comes the blessing, whether he's fervor in, has a fervor for it or whether he does not have a fervor. It's, it's probable that if you look at all the Orthodox and liberal churches in the world that are just under Christianity, that 
although people are, are ordained and they have high authority and hold high offices, cardinals and so forth, um, they really cannot just rely on their ordination and their blessing to carry the mantra. They must take it then from the moment when they were ordained and run with it and increase in its potential and in its power and in its, in its intent, intensity. The blessing flows equally over all, but the amount of the influences which any individual can obtain from it depends upon his receptivity. So now we have the priest who performs either powerfully or not so powerfully. Now we have ourselves, and what we get from it depends upon our receptivity. And receptivity, if we're going to have it, means that we are focused and centered at one point and therefore have receptivity. If he is full of love and devotion, he may be very greatly helped and uplifted. If he is carelessly thinking of some other matter, he will gain only the benefit of the impact of a higher vibration. It will be noted that when a bishop is present at a service, he always pronounces the benediction. The reason for that is that at his consecration, his higher principles are opened up much beyond those of the priest. Therefore, power at those levels can be poured through him. The same general principle holds in Freemasonry also, for it is only either an installed master or an ordained chaplain who pronounces the words of blessing in the course of the closing of the lodge. We have already seen that one who has been accepted as a pupil of a master has thereby become a channel for his influence. And while that influence is always flowing through the pupil, he can certainly direct its force for the moment upon any person as he wishes. In the same way, one who is an initiate can give the blessing of the brotherhood, which is in truth that of the king who is its head. I'll give you power to speak. I meant to say the opportunity to speak, but it is an empowerment to speak at any time. Good evening, Mother. Good evening, everyone. I had a question on uh, decrees. Um, usually when I decree, I feel a certain fire in my heart, which is a physical heat. Uh, and I feel very fortunate that I have that experience. But sometimes in the past, I've noticed that instead of feeling that fire in the heart, uh, I see uh, like a flame which is cool. It's not, a, it's not a flame which is hot, it's cool. And I was wondering if there's a teaching on it. Uh, Do you experience it in any specific place in the body or the chakra? Uh, mostly the in the heart. Most, but that's the one that's the fire, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a fire, but it lacks physical heat. It's a cool, it's a, it's a cool flame. What, what Mark used to explain to us is that when the masters come with intense fire, they are coming to assist us in the consuming of our records and our karma. So they have always promised us that as we, as we are in the dictations, and listening to them, and we receive the energy from the masters, and we give our decrees, we are balancing karma with a violet flame. We are balancing karma, karma through the great causal body of the master who is speaking to us. So in the early days of your apprenticeship, you feel tremendously hot because there's a burning of substance in the very flesh itself and in the four lower bodies. After so many years on the path, and so much diligence with violet flame, you have transmuted basically what you're going to transmute, at least for the time being, so you receive a cool flame because nothing is being going through combustion. It's, so it's a, it's a cool flame, and it's a very calming flame, quiet flame, and it has its presence. So we can measure where we are in the transmutation of our karma by, by tying into how much heat we produce when we're in the presence of a master. When we, when we uh, you know, if we were actually physically present with a master, we could be dripping with perspiration and very embarrassed that our clothes are soaked because we are going through so much uh, consuming of records. So uh, if you are thinking about what portion of 51% of your karma you've balanced, one clue is that you're no longer on fire when certain masters speak. 
it, it, it's a the, the feeling which you get is uh, peaceful and calm and pleasant and it's like a cool drink which you drink on a very hot day you haven't had anything to drink and uh, I've noticed that sometimes it will come upon you even when you're not decreeing and you're in some kind of a situation you suddenly feel that coolness around your heart and it, it's a soothing, soothing flame thank you it shows our angels are tending us all the time. It's probably why many people have chosen to be mostly vegetarians, because of it takes less energy to consume um, non-meat products. I'm not saying you shouldn't eat meat or fish, but it's, it is much easier to digest. The less, the less heavy meats you eat. I want to tell you about a mantra that I was given once. Um, I was only about nine years old. We used to have a house uh, along the seashore there in China, and we went there every summer to spend the summer, the hot days that were there. And we, get, uh, we took in boarders. And one of the boarders was this single uh, lady missionary from the inland China. And she struck up a, a friendship with me. And it was very nice. We did skits together and, and played games and swam together and so forth. Well, when she left, I can remember my father and I saw her off on the train. And she said to me, Look up now, right to, now, I'm not quite sure of the passage, but I think it's Proverbs 4, 3. But anyway, it says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. And so when I got back home, I looked it up, and I remembered it all <clears throat> these years. I remembered it uh, uh, and used that mantra as directing my paths. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct our paths. The sad uh, story about the lady was that she went inland and there were bandits and dangerous um, areas and dangerous people there. And she was murdered. I never saw her again. But she gave her life there as a missionary in China. So I just want to share this with you. Thank you very much, Ruth. You're welcome. I got this pearl today, and I have a question on it. Um, it's called it's uh, Saint Germain's pearl, and it's it's under the heading "Escape the Karma of the Dark Cycle." It says that if we give three hours of violet flame decrees on the 23rd of each month, specifically for the transmutation of personal karma, we'll cleanly escape the personal karma of the dark cycle for the month. And if we give nine hours of violet flame on the 23rd of the month. Uh, we can transmute the karma of the dark cycle for the planetary karma. If we give nine hours of violet flame, does that cover the three and the nine, or do we have to do 12? <laughs> 12. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 12. This is our, our monthly marathon, but, but think yeah. of it. You know, this is, this is the day when the dark cycle descended. And if we don't do this, our pores our four lower bodies will take in the karma that is descending on that day. And in fact, it is every 23rd uh, of, of every month right. that we have this opportunity to totally transmute our portion of the dark cycle for us just being on earth and walking the earth. And I brought that question to the altar when I was working on that pearl. How many hours do we put in, and so forth, which you just uh, named. And that's what I was given. But think about it. You come out of the 23rd of the month, and you are not carrying one iota of that dark cycle with you. You have consumed your part, your portion, and you will never have to go back to that place and do it. Now think about it. If you don't do it, it's 12 months out of the year, Every 23rd of the month, we say, well, you know, I know, I know about this uh, 
this 12-hour thing, and I'm busy, and I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Do you realize how much, how much karma you're putting into the violet flame when you do that? I mean, it's anybody who doesn't do that just does not understand the gift that God is giving to us because the whole world is bowed down by the burden of the dark cycle. But only the people who have the teaching of the violet flame know what to do about it. And then when we get a, a specific instruction that tells us what we must do, and if we do it, we'll come out having balanced it. Well, think of how, how far ahead you are of people who, when they get to that 23rd of the month, are just about crawling on the ground uh, on all fours because it is so heavy. That's why I want to do it right. Yeah. So well, if I want 12 three, hours, you know that means hours. one hour on every line of the clock. And on every line of the clock, most of us have some karma. Okay. So Thank I you. think it's, it's an exciting dispensation. I like it. <laughs> Hi, Mother. I uh, wanted to attest to the fact that 12 hours can be done in a day. When I first joined staff, well, I didn't even join staff. When I first got in touch with the teachings, I came to a service, and Mark led the service, and he shook everybody's hand. And he'd never met me before, and he says, I don't believe I know you. And I said, well, my name is Terry Freeland, because at the time, everybody called me Terry. So he said, fine, uh, you should go home and do Violet Flame. <laughs> and because he had talked about it during the service. So I did. But at the time, I wasn't working. I wasn't doing anything. I had this little house, and I took all the furniture out of a room, set up a little altar, took the decree book, and having never decreed before, sat there and I am the violet flame in action. I mean, it was very slow. <laughs> but I actually did it, and I stopped for lunch, and I stopped for dinner. But I actually did it for almost 12 hours the first day. The second day wasn't quite as long, but I actually did it one day for 12 full hours because I was totally shocked. I did this for a week came back to the service the next week, and Mark met everybody at the door, and he says, hello, my name is Mark Provitt, and I don't believe I've met you. <laughs> and so I felt pretty good about that. I got to reintroduce myself. And, and he said, well, you should go home and continue to do the Violet Flame. So, <laughs> so um, he so it, it I'm does changing work. Changing all my garments. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it really does. Work. I, I definitely needed it. I still do, uh, but it worked. The other thing I wanted to, to share with you all uh, was the original darshan. Really, was Mark around the kitchen table uh, when he would just sort of sit at the table and we'd all sort of gravitate. It was an un. It was talk about network. Somehow or other. Nobody ever said anything, but Mark would be at the table, and all of a sudden, everybody would just start from all the different doors until the table was full. And he would talk uh, and just share, and it really was family. And uh, so I'm, I'm really grateful that this is occurring again because I've missed it. I've been in kind of funny cycles on my staff. Sometimes I'm here, sometimes I'm not. Uh, been in and out. and it's just nice to, to be able to gather together to be able to do this. And uh, personally, I'm very grateful. Uh, because really, in fact, this is parenting of the first order. And uh, I need to witness to everybody here that Mark and Mother parented me personally in 1970, 71, 72. Uh, all the way up to 73. In a very personal fashion, uh, and, and I needed it because I had problems that I was going through, and, and uh, they were able to take the time at that time to be able to really connect. And we were shocked when Mark made his transition. I remember everybody was at the Four Winds, because uh, that's where I was, uh, not everybody, but when all of that whole cycle occurred, everybody just couldn't believe it because it was like, what? 
Daddy's not here. And it was, it was, uh, uh, you don't realize what you have till you don't have it. And so I would recommend everybody, if you know of somebody who is not here tonight and who was not here last week or maybe the week before, we need to all of us be our brother's keeper and just quietly just approach those people including the people who may be in level two jobs or level one jobs who may be thinking that they're busy they should be right here not anywhere else so just remind them that they should take advantage of what they have while they have it because you don't know when the dispensation will no longer be available because of circumstances not to say that mother won't be here but it may be that the cycle actually shifts you have to take the, the, the opportunities of these things uh, and tell your dweller, no, I'm going to go to the darshan, I'm going to put my shoes on, it may be snowing out, it may have to drive there, but I am going to get there because it is important. You have to make that conscious decision. So we need to help our friends remember that, that doesn't, that's an important decision. Uh, I wanted to share with mother, I don't know that I ever told you this story, the uh, uh, before I was ever in the teachings, I was almost a teenager, and I was with some Quakers in Pennsylvania. Uh, they were just doing what Quakers at the time did. I mean, I was just kind of trooping around. and I stayed with these people uh, for about three weeks, almost a month, and it was Christmas. Since we're at Christmas, I remember this story the other day. And they asked me to stay with them and help what they were doing, which was... Uh, at the time, there was some, it was the time of the Vietnam War, and things were going on, and they were actively participating and trying to help people. And they said, well, you, you really fit. Why don't you join with me? And I said, and this was like Christmas Eve. And I said, I will give you an answer in the morning. I need to pray about this. So I went to bed, and I got up the next morning, and I said, thank you so much for this invitation. But I, I'm... My service is not this personal one-on-one -on -one service that you're rendering. My, personal, my service is supposed to be impersonal. And I see myself at a big, big brick building with a stone fence around the property, with a rose garden, with fleur lis on the rain gutters, and a lot of people doing some kind of impersonal service. And I don't know what it is, but that's where I'm supposed to be. So I'm going to go on till I find it. And it was a few years later that I, we were all sitting around after a dictation on a Sunday. And at that time, everybody wore white suits to dictations or pink suits to dictations <laughs> <coughs> or pink jumpsuits to dictations. Depending on what Mark would wear, we'd all show up. And we're all laying in the grass. And the clouds are going over the sky. And all of a sudden, I look and I go, oh my god, look, there's a stone fence. And there's a rose garden. And there's the Florida leaves up on the, uh, on the rain gutters. And the impersonal service was at the time we were printing Climb the Highest Mountain. And that, we've been given the teachings of, of personal service, personal, 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 impersonal, and in the four quadrants. And that printing of the Climb the Highest Mountain, you and Mark both mentioned that because we were per participating in the production of that book, we were reaching many, many people who we didn't personally know, but we were benefiting them by giving them the word, the, uh, uh, the Korean Age Gospel. And so it was just a confirmation, and it just made me feel so good. Oh, I finally, I did something right. I'm in the right place. So it was, it was uh, uh, a a very precious moment for me at that particular realization. The other thing I wanted to share with everybody was when Mark made his transition and we all used to, we'd work at the Four Winds and then we'd have our serv uh, services in the chapel at night. We'd shut the door and race up the highway at breaking all speed limits to get there in time because we did a circle of oneness for quite a few days. And it really mattered to everybody to get there to these things. But that was a 
turning point in the organization. I mean, we went from being uh, a family in an, an ashram in, the, in a more Eastern sense to a, a corporation kind of a company uh, because everything changed. Mark had gone on, you picked everything up, people had to step in. Uh, it was almost as earth shattering as when you took the shoebox away from the tower. Remember you had a, your office up in the tower and you had a shoebox outside when we were working on climbing the highest mountain and it would get really heavy. Everybody would run up and write to, dear mother, I'm just freaked. I can't figure anything out. I'm, I, I, I'm just, I'm angry at everybody. And you'd stick this piece of paper in the shoebox and she'd come out three or four times a day <laughs> and then run back and make calls. And Moria came out one time at one service and said, mother can no longer make these calls for you. You have to make them on your own. <laughs> we all thought, <laughs> We all thought, oh my heavens, we can't do that. That season take forever. And, uh, uh, but, but we stepped up and we did this. Uh, Mark made his transition and most people at that point stepped up and we made a transition. And I view this re-energizing process when it all sort of came out quite a few months ago. My inner uh, child piped up and said, re-energize? Great. How about me? And I said, you're on. And uh, so I, I, I really feel like this re-energizing is the opportunity for everybody to uh, basically do what Jesus told Peter, which is, what is that to thee, follow thou me, uh, and really connect with our Holy Christ self, really connect with our inner child, really connect with the master of our choice, and take this opportunity to uh, just run, just accelerate wherever it is. I mean, hopefully people will find their place here to help accelerate the whole activity and the teachings and get the word out. Uh, but I, I, I view this whole time cycle as another one of these milestones. So I just wanted to share those with you. There is one more thing. This is why I wrote notes. Because uh, people have been talking for quite a few weeks and I have not jumped up. In the 70s, I had the opportunity to be uh, by myself for quite a while doing an assignment. And one of the things I did was I took Quietly Comes the Buddha and the Mother Mary book. And, you, and in the morning, I would read one, mess, or one letter from the Mother Mary book. And then at noon, I would do a rosary, and I would read one chapter of Quietly Comes the Buddha. And then in the evening, I would read one message. It takes two weeks to do that. And it was one of the most cathartic things that I have ever done. Because I would read this letter from Mother Mary. And it would cause me to introspect and think and come to some crisis. You know, oh, how am I ever going to get through this? I just, I don't know what to do. But I would put it aside, do my chores, do the rosary, and read quietly comes the Buddha and the Buddha would answer. But it would create another thing, another level, and then you'd read the message at night, and it would answer the whole thing and tie it all together. And it was a two-week spiral of doing this, and it was just marvelous. Are so, you the only one who did it? I was the only one that was there. I did it all by myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't know if anybody else has done it, but, but uh, I, I caught myself at one point walking through the streets of this little town that I was in uh, and had to almost bite my tongue because I didn't realize I was doing it out loud, but I had just read the, that particular chapter and I'm walking across the street and it's going like a mantra. This whole chapter was going like a mantra through my mind and I'm walking across the street. And the conditions and the condition of the Buddha to be comprise a ceremony of cosmic majesty to define the ten perfections from deep within the soul, even before there's a teacher to point the goal. And I'm having this whole visualization of the Buddha like this the bow of this ship and everything in front of him is the Ungrun and everything behind him is the known and this whole thing and I'm in the middle of this intersection and people are looking at me and go, oh, <laughs> you know, but, but it was, it was a marvelous, marvelous uh, spiritual communion with the mother and the father in a sense. I mean, it's just because the Buddha loves the mother, the mother loves the Buddha and it was just this neat coalescing and so I wanted to 
Let's throw that out. If somebody wants to try it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a marvelous thing to do. I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you very much, Bruce. I think that um, we will definitely have a good time looking at how sound is, is taught in these pages. I thought it was a very um, informative, extremely informative. Mighty I am presence from the heart of God in the great central sun, beloved Lord Gautama Buddha. Hear our call and answer in this hour. Strengthen us in the alpha to omega sphere of being. Bring us to your heart, Sanat Kumara. Take us to the places of light, beloved Lord Maitreya, beloved Jesus, beloved Padmasambhava. Let what we can do be done so that we might be an example for others. Let the fire of God cleanse us. Let the waters of the waterfall of life, of our own crystal fire descending into our beings, cleanse us, purge us, bring us to the point of oneness with the great hosts of the Lord. We know, O oh God, that all things are possible with thee. We know this, O oh God, and we thank thee. We call to the great central sun for our divine plan, for our supply, for direction, and especially for the tenacity to hang on to this altar, this force field, and to know that wherever we go, we are always a part of this altar. Almighty God, we call now for blessings. We call for turning over dark ones who move against us and this church. We call for the white fire of God to touch us now on the crown chakra. Let us feel now the pressing upon the skull of the place of the crystal cord. Let us receive intensification of light energy consciousness and the power of God to lead us. I call upon Rayolite and his fearlessness flame on behalf of all those who must be at other places for some time, that they might return rejoicing in their victories, in their accomplishments, their skills that they can bring back. Above all, I call for each one the fearlessness flame, whereby you have that conviction forever that God will never let you down. God will always be your shield. God will always be with you. And I have learned this in dire hours of challenges that I have been through. And I suddenly said to myself, I will never be concerned again about this calamity, that calamity, this accusation, these lies, etc., etc. For have I not seen in all of my life, in all of my lifetimes, that God always cares for me and always cares for each one of us. So with fearlessness flame, we can bind fear and doubt, go to the heart of our living Savior, conquer the two o'clock line, which we should do before we enter the age of Aquarius. Our Father, Mother, God, we thank you for the opportunity to descend into this matter universe so that we might be here at this time specifically for the binding of the fallen angels. We came for that purpose, O oh God, and we return gratefully and hopefully victorious in your sight. Therefore, O oh God, we fear not any situation or predicament for we know that you send your angels to us and that we will always be in our perfect place when we have neither fear nor doubt. Blessed Mother Kuan Yin, Blessed Mother Mary, all hosts of the Lord, thank you for bringing us together. May there be great victories yet and a forestalling of burdens among upon mankind 
in the planetary body. In the name Jesus Christ, we call for this victory of our planetary home. We accept it done this hour in full power and we call to the seven mighty Elohim now to transmute the cause effect record and memory of the astrology of the last three years of this century. Let it be consumed by the sacred fire and let the world know the violet flame. Send me, O God, in thy name. Amen.